Good afternoon. Xiao Hao. I'm Colleen Chen, a professor at Santa Clara University, and it's my honor to introduce the panelists for our final panel today on patent litigation. And it was very nice to have Judge, Chief Judge Rader providing remarks. I think that will provide some context for today's conversation about the impact on innovation of the different patent systems that we are part of here in China and in the US and in China. So we're going to be led off by my co-moderator, John Huang, the co-director of the Institute for Internet Law at Peking University Law School. After he speaks, we're going to have a series of presentations and then a, hopefully a lively discussion about patent law and what really following chief judge's comments we can learn from each other in terms of the two different systems. So first will be Song Ping, who's a professor at Peking University. Then Judge Ron White, who is a judge in the Northern District of California. Then Dwayne Vows from Google will speak, followed by Roger from Alibaba, and then Neil Chatterjee, who's the co-chair of the Intellectual Property Group at Oric. So I will now turn it over to Sinker Zhang Huang to talk about the patent systems in both countries. Good afternoon. First, I wanted to thank everybody here, and uh, I'm very honored to be back. You know, my first IP classes were from Goldstein more than 20 years ago at Stanford or for my JD program. And uh, I think under the uh, new dean, um, uh, you know, she'll be in Asia, Shanghai, Singapore, Tokyo, and then Hong Kong. So we're going to have foster greater relationship with Asia. And thank you for Dean Zhang for the support that to attend the conference and to the center. Okay. I'm going to start a presentation. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, you know, the first slide probably after the Judge Rader's speech. You know, this passionate speech. We probably don't don't need our slide anymore. You know, innovation is good. The patent system is pro innovation. Yes. Even you consider taking uh, into, uh, in, into the troll problem and the uh, asking for you know. Uh, inappropriate value for your patent. Now, using IT industry as an example, you know, I'm chuckling a little bit because I'm using Samsung Note 2 and they're going to come up with Note 3 with a, C a core CPU and larger screen at a cheaper price. So if you look at that, the patent system is not creating any problem in the IT or pharmaceutical area, as Judge Rader say. Then, then we go to the question, does the Chinese and US patent system promote innovation? Okay, you consider the, uh, the application, the enforcement mechanism, as, as well as the law policy. Um, the while the U.S. I think is transforming and, and, and it's basically okay, we can refer to Neil from Oryx presentation later. How about China? Okay, uh, we'll look at the application, a huge increase application. It's two million application last year. You look at the utility model, actually go by 50%. The invention application, uh, actually, from half million to about sixty, about, um, you know, half million to about six uh, six hundred forty thousand application. So, but you look at most application actually come from domestic co company. Uh, they are driven by incentive, subsidy of the government, or the you know promotion, encouragement by the local authority, and the goal to become an innovative society in the future for China. The number of applications filed by non-Chinese company actually grow. Also, you know, 6% is not bad if you in any patent office by foreign multinational in China. But, you know, in China, comparing the growth of domestic Chinese companies is, is very little. But the number of applications filed does not necessarily reflect the level of innovation, okay? Everything has to be market-driven in order to be for real. If you have this subsidized system and the policy would distort the, the values chain, then you probably don't get the real innovation, okay? We will see that from the last slide of Roger from Alibaba, okay? Then we talk about enforcement trend. It's very rapidly increased the patent lawsuit, most, mostly Chinese against Chinese, very interesting. Uh, if you read from Duane of Google's slide later, it is close to 8,000 patent lawsuits in China, but I have to caution you that involve administrative lawsuit, which is challenging the invalidation decision or re-examination decision. Um, you know, we have injunction without eBay type of consideration in China yet, 
which may be good or bad, because that's the problem where uh, Judge Rader talked about. When you have automatic injunction, you could hijack uh, you know, certain product or certain service with automatic injunction. And we have increasing uh, damage war, Snyder case. Um, we actually have multi-million multi dollar, US dollar war become very, very common. Uh, just came out with the interdigital Huawei lawsuit in Shenzhen last month. Um, you know, Huawei was awarded 3.2 million US dollar uh, damage against uh, interdigital. And we have creative use of home core as a protective shield. The Huawei interdigital case is one of the examples. That's very interesting. And now we have the slide from Professor Mark Lamley and produced by Randy Wu and Mark on this. Okay, and this is actually show that most of the case, 95% Chinese are defendant in the US lawsuit. Only 5% are plaintiff. Where you see Taiwan, which is part of China, is more advantage stage, 50-50. And look at the cases, you know, most of the cases, Chinese company lost by default, so don't even bother to show up. 28 of 48, uh, 45 losses are by default judgment. Um, finally, come to my recommendation. I think U.S. should avoid hindering innovation. Doing this, you know, is really the abuse of the litigation system, not the abuse of the patent system. When you do something, you don't hinder innovation, especially by individual, startup, and small company. You look at Cisco, how it grow. It acquires startup company. If a startup company without the core patent value uh, portfolio, the value will be less. So you don't do that, okay? China should let the market drive the innovation and it's rule change, no artificial policy or incentive, okay? Don't pursue large filing number. It's not gonna help your innovation. The third one, both China and US should leave the politics out, just like the phone call to Judge Rader. You know, it shouldn't happen. You should learn from each other, cooperate each other, let your homegrown home home company play by the fair international rule that encourage innovation, okay? Perfect. My, my co-director, uh, John Ping, is gonna talk about that later, okay? Thank you. I think the, uh, the first be speaker should be Judge, Judge Wright. And then. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me all right? I have a bad voice in the first place, and sometimes I speak very softly, and I definitely need a microphone. So can you hear me in the back all right? Okay. My um, task this, this afternoon is to give you an overview of the remedies for patent infringement in the United States. There are two basic provisions or uh, statutes that provide for the remedies for patent infringement in the United States. One is that the court may grant injunctions in accordance with the principles of equity to prevent the violation of any rights secured by a patent on such terms as the court deems reasonable. For years, the statute was interpreted to basically require an injunction if there was found to be infringement. But the Supreme Court, in a case called eBay versus Merck Exchange, okay, indicated that the, the granting of an injunction should be based on the same rules that are used for determining whether an injunction should issue in cases other than patent cases. In other words, patent cases shouldn't be an exception, which meant that there are now cases where the courts refuse to grant injunctions, and that has in part remedied one concern that many people had, and that was that the so-called troll was uh, kind of blackmailing companies by suing with the threat of an injunction. Now under eBay, it's hard to see a basis for an injunction since the uh, troll company doesn't make a product itself. It just uh, uh, sells uh, or 
sells licenses and makes its money that way. So eBay has curtailed the troll from, um, uh, I guess one could say, holding up the system or uh, getting um, um, injunctions where they really don't belong and are unfair. The other, there's the other statutory provision dealing with damages, talks about the warding of, or, or dealing with remedies, talks about the warding of um, damages for patent infringement, and basically says it cannot be less than what is called a reasonable royalty. So if there is patent infringement, even though a patentee could not uh, prove that it lost any sales, it's still enti entitled to a reasonable royalty. And that reasonable royalty is set by a jury if either side requests it, which it raises some question in, I know a lot of um, people outside the United States as to whether that's a good idea having juries award damages, but uh, under our law they have a right, there's a right to have a jury in a patent case if you want it. And the courts are allowed to increase the damages by threefold if the circumstances are appropriate. That does not happen very often in my experience, but the provision is there. And expert testimony uh, may be allowed to help a jury or the judge determine the appropriate amount of damages. This, in my view, is an area that has been subject to some abuse in our system. Uh, there are those that might say that uh, you can hire an economic expert who will say most anything if he's paid properly uh, for his services. And that has resulted in some verdicts being unreasonably high uh, some of these experts are very uh, glib, very well, uh, express themselves very well, and uh, are very persuasive. And yet, if you do a close analysis of what they have to say, you might have some question as to whether or not their opinions are very valuable. To determine lost profits, basically, that's pretty straightforward. The amount of money that a patent um, owner lost due to the infringement is what you're entitled to as lost profits. It's the most classic example of lost profits is lost sales. And basically what you have to show that but for the infringement, you would have received a sale, uh, but because of the infringing party, uh, you did not uh, get it or that the sale that the infringer got was one you would have gotten, uh, but for the infringement. Another type of damages that is, are available are called price erosion damages. If because of the infringing product, you're forced to lower your prices, you can get that difference in damages. Also, you can recover what are called what is called compensation for collateral sales. Collateral sales are sales of non-patented products that generally are uh, made at the same time that the patented device is sold. So if, say, there was a hose that was uh, attached to the patented device and if somebody bought the patented device, they would normally buy that hose from the same company, you might be able to get those kind of damages uh, as well as the profits from the sale of the patented device itself. Let's turn now to a reasonable royalty. There's no single method that exists for how a court uh, must determine a reasonable royalty. There's an old case that I've cited, I think, uh, it's on the next page, uh, Georgia Pacific versus U.S. plywood um, that talks about 15 factors that may be considered in determining what a reasonable royalty is. As a practical matter, 
I think that case is an unfortunate one because it gives a lot of leeway to experts to pick and choose among the factors and come out with some pretty unreasonable uh, opinions sometimes. Uh, the Federal Circuit, which reviews what trial courts does, has never put its stamp of approval on the Georgia Pacific method of determining a, a reasonable royalty has indicated that the factors that are listed as relevant to a reasonable royalty may be considered. But I think what we really need is just a rule that says that damages must be proved by an economically sound theory and based on facts that have been proved in the case. To determine a reasonable royalty, the classic uh, way of doing so is if it's a, if available is to look at past licenses or licenses of equivalent uh, or somewhat similar uh, devices. It's often though the case that it's hard to find uh, equivalent uh, licenses and therefore you necessarily have to come up with some other economically sound method for determining what a reasonable royalty is. And this has led, again, in my view, to some extreme examples or extreme theories that have been provided by experts that have resulted historically in some awfully high uh, damage awards. And I think, uh, I obviously can't speak on behalf of the Federal Circuit, but I think in general, there's been an effort made to try and ensure the damages are determined in a logical, logical and sound uh, way. And perhaps the rule that has now been made clear is that you cannot just automatically assume that the damages for patent infringement are the difference between the selling price of the product with a with patented component in it and the um, price of the uh, next competing uh, product. Or, or If there's a group of components that make up the product, you can only get for the loss of profits on the particular component that infringes. So if there are a number of features of a product to recover damages you, for the sale of the uh, patented device, you can only get, again, that component. You can't get the difference between the price of the product as a whole with all the components in it and uh, the next uh, or comparable selling products or competing products unless the only basis uh, for the increase in price is the patented component. If the patented feature is what causes the price to be higher and is the only reason that the price is higher, you can recover those damages. I know I'm out of time, so let me just quickly uh, finish up. Um, Basically, to determine a reasonable royalty, you need to look at the relationship of the um, patented device and uh, or the, the prior license and the patented de device. There has to be some nexus or connection between the two. There used to be a rule of thumb. Nobody. I guess people know where it came from, but it doesn't make any sense to use it. What we call the 25% rule, where economists would come in and say, well, I'm starting with the 25% rule. Uh, this Federal Circuit has now said, that's out. You, you can't just use some arbitrary uh, standard. And that uh, basically covers uh, the system for determining damages uh, under the U.S. system. I think uh, in closing, I would say that uh, the rules are there to keep damages in line and damages appropriate, but um, 
the trial judges who have lots of discretion as to what testimony or evidence is admissible on uh, the um, question of a reasonable royalty have got to be strict and only allow into evidence uh, such testimony as is supported by a sound and reasonable economic theory. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to first highlight some of the major differences between the two countries' patent systems and then offer my personal views on innovation in China and uh, particularly at Alibaba. So for uh, patent prosecution, um, there's several ways that uh, China's system is different from the US. Uh, one claim scope is different. In China, um, the claim scope must be closely aligned with the patent specification. You do not have a lot of freedom to expand from the spec and try to broaden the claims. The uh, China system also has strict restrictions on technical requirements. A patent must be aimed at solving a technical problem, um, provide a technical solution, and have technical characteristics. Um, this means um, there are severe limits on business method patents. For example, patents such as um, managing your tax return and investing, uh, making investments. Those are not possible in China. Um, and even for software patents, there are some limits. For example, if you have an internet patent, if you want to file an internet patent on um, advertising, how to in, increase uh, ads click-through rates and to generate a better ad income, um, that's very difficult in China. There are also procedural restrictions on prolonging prosecution in China. In the U.S., you can um, file RCEs, request for continued examination, to um, keep examining an uh, application for years and years and years until you get it approved by the examiner. Uh, in China, there are very uh, strict limits on that. There are also uh, uh, procedural restrictions in China on obtaining multiple patents for the same uh, filing. Um, unlike in the U.S., where you can get continuations and continuations and continuations of the same invention, uh, in China, there, there are strict limits on that. Now, uh, in terms of patent litigation, China is also different from the U.S. in several major ways. One, discovery is very limited. Um, the plaintiff must provide uh, very detailed and notarized uh, evidence of infringement for the case to be accepted by the court. And it's possible that the, the court may order if, if the uh, plaintiff cannot uh, provide satisfactory evidence, the court may order the defendant to preserve evidence, but that's at the court's discretion. The court may not always do that. Also, forum shopping is limited. Um, for internal cases, courts often held, hold that um, the, the place of filing is where infringement occurred, and they may consider that to be where the defendant's servers are located basically at the at defendant's home court. And uh, the cases are decided entirely by judge, not by jury. And also, damage amount is small compared to uh, US standards, but plaintiffs win uh, quite often. Uh, according to statistics, the average reward is only tens of thousands of dollars, for example, $20,000 or $30,000. But plaintiff, uh, plaintiffs win well over 60% uh, of the time. Okay, um, now um, I'm going to 
uh, offer some of my own perspectives on innovation in China, and especially at Alibaba. So my view is that um, innovation happens because businesses have to serve their customers. So regardless of the patent system or government policies, um, they must provide innovative solutions to their customers. For example, um, when um, ta uh, Taobao was established 10 years ago um, to provide e-commerce, there was a very few uh, credit history data to, um, in China. Um, you cannot, you know, run a credit check on someone and get a reliable credit score and know that person's trustworthiness. So for that reason, um, Alibaba established Alipay to provide online escrow service to, to establish this trust between buyer and servers and facilitate e-commerce. And after we've done that, we've, our business grew, and now we have massive and massive amount of data to process. Um, there was one day last year where we processed over 100 million transactions in one day. And last year, our, we processed more transaction volume than eBay and com Amazon combined. So to do that, you cannot just buy technology off the shelf. You cannot just buy IBM servers and Oracle databases and think they will work. Because these companies do not have to deal with the problems we have to deal with. They do not have to deal with the massive amount of data and in such a short time. So due to that, we have to um, we'll develop our own technology to process the data and do it fast enough and secure enough um, and provide the cloud computing infrastructure to support that. So we have to innovate to make that happen. Now, after we process that data, we want to make use of that. And we are making use of that by providing micro loans to small businesses uh, because we know the customers, we, 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 even for the small sellers, uh, because we have their data, we know how they've um, conducted their business on Taobao over the years. Uh, we can give them micro loans with confidence that they'll pay us back. Um, and this is an innovative solution that, and then that banks will not be able to provide because um, it's not cost effective for traditional banks to provide micro loans. So regardless, now some of those things are not patentable in China. Some of those things may not even be patentable in the US. Um, but we, um, we consider those innovations regardless and we try to patent um, some of the implementations, some of the features, but um, they are innovations that happen because we serve our customers. So thank you. While we're transitioning, can I ask you, Roger, um, Judge White mentioned the 15 factors that courts can con consider to come up with a reasonable royalty. In the Chinese damages law, if you know, what are the principles or number of factors that can be considered to come up with the appropriate rate? Is there an equivalent way of thinking about damages? Yeah, I think uh, it's similar um, in, in terms of uh, um, uh, lost profits and also um, you, you may be able to get uh, 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 restitution to defendant's sales. On the royalty, they tend to be very specific. You know, sometimes you want to do comparable licensing agreement. You have enter in the region. Sometimes you try to use the one in Taiwan, but it's rejected by the core because here's mainland China. You cannot use the one in Taiwan. Previous licenses are very important then. We'll get to that later. <laughs> okay. I said you're you saying the previous licenses can be very important. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a warm welcome, uh, particularly to our guests from China. Thanks to Stanford and Peking University for um, organizing this event. I think it's uh, more important than ever that we have fertile exchanges on topics such as these, which uh, are of great importance to both countries and businesses and officials in, in both countries. So um, I'm pleased to be a part of it. 
Uh, the, the topic for our panel was to talk about the role of, of patents and innovation in the U.S. and Chinese systems, and uh, to the extent that policies and practices globally uh, can be influenced by the goings-on in one or another part of the globe and the perception of how well the systems in one or another country are working. Um, I titled uh, the talk, uh, you know, whether there's a new dialectics of innovation um, you know, between China and the U.S. in respect of our marketplaces and our patent systems. And I think in looking at this question, it's important not just to look at the dynamics of the patent system, but also the marketplace dynamics to see if there are any themes or, or, or strains that are being picked up uh, by one country from another and whether or not that's a, a good thing and will really support innovation in the long run. So by starting and looking at the, the U.S. marketplace, um, historically the U.S. has been well known for being a very innovative environment, particularly in the technology sector, and that's been true throughout the 20th century and going into the 21st. The, if you could summarize, you could say big ideas are born and, and grow here first, and that's well known, and it's been uh, a topic of study and, and a focus for emulation in other countries around the world. The U.S. is also well known as a, to, to be a big marketplace, um, as one of the most prosperous nations in, on the planet. A lot of high-end products, increasingly um, uh, valuable products that are made in China first, uh, get sold into the U.S. marketplace. Um, and to the benefit of both U.S. companies and companies globally. Um, in the midst of this, uh, you know, we, we're experiencing the fact that expanding Chinese firms, and it's worth noting that um, in the last 10 to 15 years, as China has continued to develop its economy, um, a lot of the successful firms aren't just doing well in China in the developing marketplace there, but have really been expanding their global reach. And that informs a lot of the innovation policy, uh, I would assume, in China, and in, in not just looking to shore up the Chinese patent system, but in understanding how Chinese companies are faring globally and how that may play back into policies that are uh, performed within China. So we have some recent examples where companies like uh, Huawei um, had some acquisitions blocked. And so, and Huawei has is, is stated recently that they no longer consider the U.S. a, a strategic marketplace for development because there's so many concerns by the, the U.S. government. Um, and recently, ZTE and Huawei were prevented from being a supplier to Sprint as they built out their 4G network. Now, this is in very particular areas. Uh, ZTE sells handsets in the United States and has a business on the consumer-facing products, but there's concern on the back end um, that these companies may have equipment that would be used for ill purposes. But it's not a uniform picture. There's no uniform hostility towards Chinese companies. If we take the case of Alibaba, they've been expanding globally. They're one of the examples of what I'm talking about, a Chinese company that's really been successful abroad. And they were successfully able to acquire Octiva and Vendio, uh, two companies that helped them establish a presence in the United States. Um, in terms of coming into the United States, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in the patent climate, Chinese companies have to think about if they want to enter the United States, what do they need in order to, to do business here? And patents are increasingly factoring into that calculus. So the U.S. patent system, Judge Rader mentioned earlier that you know, the patents are enshrined in our Constitution, and the uh, sort of encouragement is that they're to be used to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Um, of late, the U.S. patent system has been known for a number of things that we've been discussing. Uh, Non-practicing entities, NPEs, or as they're commonly known, trolls, software patent proliferation, um, a secondary marketplace where it, in, historically companies would have the patents that they developed internally, but now there's a very robust marketplace for buying and selling patents. And a lot of U.S. companies that have 
grown very quickly and found themselves in a very disruptive state have needed to go to the secondary market to protect themselves. We're also known for big damages, high stakes operating company disputes as between, for example, uh, Samsung and Apple, and the International Trade Court, which is a new gatekeeper that's been involved in patent litigation. Um, so looking for a minute at the Chinese marketplace, very incredible time in history, rapidly expanding economy across all sectors, not just in software and IT, and the government is undertaking to uh, implement market reforms with um, technology investment and entrepreneurship really stoking big opportunities. And these are opportunities not just for Chinese companies, startups and established companies, but foreign companies who are looking to come into China. Um, it's you know, well known that Ford and GM uh, have been very successful selling automobiles to a rising tide of uh, the growing middle class of Chinese consumers. And so there's a lot of interest from U.S. companies and companies globally in expanding their business footprint in China. Um, and of course, ch expanding foreign firms don't always face a warm welcome in China. Um, the government policy will have a different complexion depending on the industry sector. Uh, certainly, you know, Google has had a complex relationship in China. We do a lot of business there. It's been complex. The way I think about it is that you know complexity is a given in life. These are things that uh, are just a part of life. But relationships are important and not always to be taken for granted. So it's better to have a complex relationship than just complexity. So the Chinese patent system, well known, the government has been pushing to strengthen its patent system. There have been a lot of reforms over the last few years. The stated goals of the National Patent Development Strategy are encouraging innovation and promoting economic development in the unique context of a socialist market economy. So that suggests that as the government is implementing liberalization of the economy, it still wants to keep a very active hand in policy setting um, and you know, very similar goals to what we have here in the United States under our con constitution. But it's early days, even though things are happening very quickly and the, patent, the Chinese patent system, at least on the outside, is known for a very rapid expansion in the number of applications across all technology areas, a high number of litigations, low damages awards, but upward trends. There have been the cases involving Chint and Schneider Electric. Um, Samsung sustained a $78 million verdict. Apple has lost some big decisions there. So there's certainly a trend towards allowing for more damages, and then there's uncertainty over the quality and consequences of rapid growth. So people have expressed concerns that there's a lot of patents, but are they really representing true innovation? So, you know, what do we make of all of this uh, and, and looking at it? We have the question concerning patents and innovations, and Judge Rader made a great point that in certain segments, it's the, the correlation between having a patent system and promoting innovation is very close, but is it enough that patents um, in the software space, there's been a lot of expressions of doubt as to whether software companies really innovate because patents are available to them, and in the absence of a patent system, wouldn't they be doing the same things? Um, so China, the, um, in China, we need to keep this in mind as you have more companies entering into the internet economy and selling software abroad. So even if patents don't promote innovation, is it enough that they help to structure technology transactions and function as the currency of innovation? And to the extent that patents can have an impact on the course of a new entrant or a company that's expanding rapidly, how do we structure policies to support a fair marketplace and orderly competition, even if patents aren't serving their original purpose. And I think there were panels here about the growth of competition law and um, how that is playing out. And I think in lieu of uh, sort of some of the issues that we're experiencing here in the patent system and abuses around litigation, competition law should really be stressed. I just want to quickly go through some trends um, to, and talk very briefly, since my time is, is up, 
about some of the implications. We could see here that in a very short period of time, this graph covers 125 years, we can see how the US patent system, for instance, has really sort of gone along, and it wasn't until the 1980s that it spiked. From that time, patent Chinese, China's patent system has gone from near low, no activity to surpassing sort of the application volume of uh, the US. Pretty impressive, um, but a lot of change all at once. One of the issues is the looming number of utility model patents. These are patents that are subject to less examination scrutiny, but can be used to exclude products from the Chinese marketplace. Um, the US doesn't have a utility model system, but compared to Germany, which is one of the more active jurisdictions for utility model practice, the Chinese uh, utility model applications are manifold more in number. And these are the patents that, you know, one has recently been asserted by Zhijian against Apple um, related to the Siri functionality. We're probably going to see more activity through utility model practice, but this is a danger zone for both NPE activity and patent abuse. So it's something, as we move forward, stakeholders in business, in the government, and in policy making bodies have to dis determine what's the right balance. Because as Singer pointed out, most Chinese litigation is Chinese on Chinese companies. We wouldn't want to see this abused relative to foreign companies or Chinese companies. And of course, litigations are rising annually. We're now close to 8,000 suits a year. To put it in context in the US, we're I think between two and 3,000 or between three and 4,000. So quite a volume. So some key questions, how will patent proliferation in China be used in industry and trade policy? Will a growing secondary market, there are a lot more Chinese companies buying and selling patents, particularly buying patents that are relevant to the US market where they may want to enter, and selling companies because there's such an excess to US companies and other companies wanting to enter the marketplace. Will there be a right balance there or will this help to fuel abuse? Um, and also around NPEs, as Judge Rader mentioned, we don't necessarily want to discriminate against certain entity types, but combined with damages systems, cost of litigation, these things can create abuse. And so these are some of the key questions that we move forward. I would say patents aren't needed for software innovation or innovation in the internet space, and we have to think carefully about how we want to position them and encourage them to support the kind of innovation that we really want. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I, am, uh, I've been, I was asked to speak a little bit about does the U.S. litigation system promote software uh, and internet types of, uh, I of innovation. Now, I'm going to start with a little bit of an apology. Uh, uh, I was, uh, felt very fortunate to hear the remarks uh, that Judge Rader gave uh, earlier today. Um, and many of the things that I'm going to say may be a little bit duplicative. Um, of what uh, he said. But to the extent that what I say is different from what he says, remember that he is a world-renowned intellectual property expert, the chief judge of the Federal Circuit, nominated by the President, and also confirmed by the United States Senate. And I'm just a guy. <laughs> so to the extent that we differ in our opinions, he wins. So um, I always like to start my presentations by starting with what I call the bottom line. This is the conclusion that, uh, that I had and I reached in framing some of my remarks. And the conclusion that I reached was quite similar to what you uh, heard Judge Rader say, is that 
The United States system is broken in many ways, but it does, on the whole, protect software and internet innovations. Uh, we'll talk a little bit um, about this, but really, if we just start with what are the issues that are presented in software and internet technologies, is that software and internet technologies are rapidly moving. I entered the legal industry um, in uh, the early 90s, right when the internet boom was starting. And uh, the hottest company around uh, was eBay. And eBay is still a great company today. But today, the really, really hot internet companies are companies like Facebook. Uh, uh, Facebook would be a great one. Pinterest is another one in the United States. And we can go on with more and more names about really hot uh, emerging companies in the marketplace. And the problem is, is that uh, the United States system does not quickly protect uh, innovation. Um, if we look at the Constitution, and, and I will actually uh, subject you to the clause that we've been talking about, uh, we, we talk about protecting inventions. Now, every single panelist other than Judge White that has spoken so far this afternoon has talked about protecting innovation. But, as I'll show you, innovation and invention are actually slightly different things. And in protecting one, we may be neglecting the other. And the final thing I wanted to observe is, is a, an, an issue that um, I think bridges gaps. And one of the reasons I feel quite fortunate to be um, at this conference and, and being given the privilege to address all of you is that legitimate companies feel victimized at times by the flaws in the US system. Now, if you talk to United States companies and United States governmental entities, and they talk about the Chinese system behind closed doors, they will say the reason they don't invoke the power of the Chinese court system is because they don't trust it. And if you go to Chinese companies, as I have, and talk to Chinese agencies, and you say, why don't you invoke the power of the US litigation system, they respond the same way, they say, that they don't trust the US system to support what their legitimate needs may be. Now this is an opportunity for us to recognize the cultural differences and the suspicions that exist between our two great nations. Because each country looks at the other with a certain degree of suspicion and mistrust. One of the eye-opening moments I had was when I was in China last year and I was speaking to a number of Chinese companies and some governmental entities and they were expressing to me that they feel quite victimized by the International Trade Commission. And I shared with them that I represent many United States companies that also have concerns about the way that the International Trade Commission operates, and they feel quite the same. So in that instance, it really wasn't an issue of China versus America. It was really an issue of communication between people who share interests on the way certain things are being done. And at the end of the day, the fundamental problem is not about patent trolls or various people engaging in a legitimate litigation process that exists in the United States, but rather the abusive tactics that certain people choose to follow. It isn't a country versus country issue, it's a systemic issue. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the issues in the patent system that I see that I would like, I hope will provoke a dialogue about how we go about protecting things in the United States and creating the right incentive models. I'll suggest to all of you that sometimes the United States patent system focuses too much on invention, but not on innovation and discovery. An example where that doesn't happen, I'll suggest, is pharmaceuticals. Uh, I thought Judge Rader made some very, very appropriate remarks where there is innovation and discovery and it translates into invention when you're talking about medical issues, for example. In the context of software, however, and the, and the internet, it seems less clear to me. The other issue, which Judge White talks, talked about, particularly in the software and internet context, patent damages are exceedingly difficult to value, and it's hard to say what this one tiny widget out of a million widgets, how that translates into an effective value. This happens all the time in the United States in, in, in litigation of internet patents because most services on the internet are offered for free. 
And so how do you value a zero? Well, you tie it to the advertising model, but then the connection is much more attenuated. The final thing I'd like to suggest is, is that often great people will innovate and discover things even when there's no financial reward through patent protection. And this is a really important concept. When I first started working in Silicon Valley, if you talked to a startup company in most instances that was doing software or internet work about seeking patents, the venture capitalists would say that you were crazy. And the reason why is they wanted execution, get to market, develop a user base. That was what the name of the game was. In today's world, it's quite different. Venture capitalists are often demanding that people file for patents because if the company does not continue to exist, they want to have an asset that remains that they can use to at least recover some of their investment. So let's take a look at Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. As Judge Rader said, the Constitution says, the Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Now the interesting thing here is that it actually, I don't know if this laser pointer works, it actually says discoveries here, but this has been interpreted under the Patent Act to really be about something new, useful, non-obvious, something that is uh, valuable to people in terms of a new technology. Now, I wanted to understand a little more what does innovation and invention mean? So I went to the source of all information in the world to me, Wikipedia. And if you look at Wikipedia, it talks about invention in the way that I think the founders, at least at some level, envisioned invention. They said an invention is a unique or novel device, method, composition, or process. It may be an improvement upon a machine or product or a new process for creating an object or a result. Now, this doesn't say anything about how is the invention used. It just says it's something unique or novel in some way. Innovation, on the other hand, something that is often not protected by the Patent Act, is the development of a new customer value through solutions that meet new needs, unarticulated needs, or old customer and market needs in new ways. And therein lies the difficulty. In the United States, we have quite a lot of controversy around the notion of, do we protect software patents that are really articulated business methods that are made into software implementations. And the difficulty that we have here is really this intersection between the two. Is it purely an innovation or is it an invention? And does that distinction matter? And right now, the United States is having quite a debate over how do we reconcile those two things. Now, I wanted to point out a couple things about the incentive structures associated with what we seek to promote through the constitutional provisions. Albert Einstein was not an inventor. Instead, he founded something called E equals MC squared. This is a discovery. This is not something that people can generally patent. I'll suggest to you that many people, that he didn't necessarily need to know that he had patent protection in order to do this. On the other hand, we have all of these people in the United States who were fantastic inventors. Benjamin Franklin, one of the greatest uh, patent, one of the greatest inventors in American history, um, actually never sought a patent because the Patent Act didn't exist then. And he would have had to file for patent protection in all 13 colonies. Uh, we have the Wizard of Menlo Park, Thomas Edison, who had 1,093 patents. Incidentally, Menlo Park was in New Jersey, not the one right down the road here. Um, and then Orville and Wilbur Wright, who uh, sought patents on their airplane and were actually some of the most aggressive asserters of patents in their time. Now, the issue with the abuses in the US litigation system is that the current legal framework sometimes allows for patent assertion entities or non-practicing entities to assert their patents. And it takes a long time and is very expensive. 
The problem I have with that is that it takes money away from creating new innovations and puts it in the hand of people who are just building their own personal wealth. And when we think about promoting the useful arts and sciences, we really want to talk about building national wealth in exchange for a fair reward. Patent assertion entities sometimes take that away. And it's really for this reason. If This is uh, actually uh, Colleen's uh, research. If you look at this, in, in patent assertion entities, when the amount in dispute is low, which is typically what you're going to see in most patent assertion entities, the costs are extraordinary in comparison to it. On the other hand, when it's a, it tends to be a higher value case, which tends to be more competitors, the costs are not, not as extraordinary in comparison. This is, this is the problem that indicates the abuse in the system. Now, I'm out of time, um, but I'm happy to uh, talk with people afterwards with thoughts on this. But I'll suggest to you that really thinking about what is it that we're seeking to promote in order to spur innovation to spur bringing new things and new technologies to market is the way that we should think about protecting intellectual property and then having a system of enforcement that doesn't make it about the litigation cost that is the driver of rewarding it, but instead is the actual fair value of what those inventions contributed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So, for clearly uh, give my opinion, so I want to speak in Chinese. Uh,我的这个题目，翻译的题目呢，有一点比较怪异，就是按照中文来说叫恨爱，恨爱交加，互联网开放平台的专利竞争。呃，为什么用这样一个题目呢？实际上，我就想用一个非常短的时间内，把
到下一个时代的时候，他们会真的爱这个专利，因为现在这么多的互联网公司都已经聚集了大量的专利，他们目前是一种防御性的这种心态，但是到了一定阶段，他还依然会利用这个专利制度来去获得利益。就像我们前边 r e a d e r 法官去讲，这个制度它是带给我们市场经济的一个非常好的一个竞争的工具。那么互联网公司早期呢，是因为它没有那么强烈的一个市场的这样一个环境，因为我们知道互联网。刚开始诞生的时候，它是没有那么多商业模式的。现在商业模式啊、呃、发展起来了，所以商业模式一定是要基于知识产权这个制度发展的。所以我下边一个呢，因为还没有出现，所以我呢自己是在心里打了一个问号。但我已经给了他的回答，就是他一定是非常喜爱这个专利的。啊、呃。那我在这里边呢，也想提醒一下大家，就是说，开放的这个概念，这个 open 这个含义是不一样的。呃，我们看到是呃不一样的开放的含义呢，它的这个专利政策也是不一样。左边的这些呢，它是开放接口，那它的开放的程度没有那么大。啊，那么开放接口呢，主要是在 interface 这一块它的专利的这个布局呢，它是还是要，或者是版权的这种掌控，还是在它的核心技术那一块但是它跟用户的界面这一边呢是开放了。但是我们看到像啊安卓这种系统，或者现在我们看到有很多像 Facebook 和 Google 它这样的一些公司呢，它的这种开放呢是从内核技术就开始开放了啊。那么我们说这两类的开放呢态度是不一样的。那我今天主要还是讲后边的这样一种开放。那我在这里还要再交代一下，其实呢，软件世界或者是我们说整个这个呃呃这个技术这个领域的发展，它对于知识产权的这个应用和政策呢，确实是有不同的这种倾向。在早期，我们看到就是基纯粹基于商业软件这一块呢，它是强烈的一种版权的保护，还有呢专利的这样的一种啊属于进攻性的这样一种武器，它是以主动诉讼为主的。那么我们看到他们都非常坚持自己的品牌商标的这样的一种应用是非常啊坚持的。然后我们来看它的专它的技术标准是基于的是私有标准，这就是一个我自己的一个主要的观点，就是说在啊。Closed source 这样的一个呃平台上，它的这个标准是私标准。那么我们看到了开放的平台上，它的这个版权呢是一种弱版权保护，是基于现在的这种啊 GPL 许可证下边的一种保护。那么专利呢，它拒绝了专利或者申请专利呢，它是以一种防御性的目的为主。那我们看到商标也是他非常重视的，每个企业都绝对强烈的要求自己的品牌，但是技术标准是不一样的，他们的技术标准呢是依据的是叫开放标准，所以这是我的一个主要的观点，他们的生命力所在就在于他们采用的是开放标准，它有更多的包容，有这种啊兼容性，所以它的产品会广泛的在市场当中会去啊。发展壮大，那么我们说，呃，两个这种啊不同的这种呃软件的平台，呃，利用了不同的知识产权战略，其实他们的目的都是一个，都是为了获得一个市场的利益啊，这个没有任何的呃呃这个是与非的这种判断，只不过是他们获取利益的渠道是不一样的。所以我们今天研究知识产权制度，是说一方面我们要看不同的公司、不同的理念，他们都是依据一个什么样的一个策略，然后我。我们从学术上这个研究是更多的是要关注他们这样的一些做法可能会未来对于创新和竞争带来哪些影响啊？那么我最后下边的这个红字呢，也是在想说，互联网开放平台跟前边这两个还有一点不一样，因为它更加强调的是 freedom, open and sharing， 它更加强调的是这一点，所以呢，它可能会更加的是把这个什么呢？把这个专利的这个早期的这个专利的事情弱化。一些，但是到了后期的时候，当它也非常强大的时候，它在可能会回归到原来我们说这个 close source 的那样的一个一个境界上。那我在这里边有一个 case study， 啊、呃，我们北京大学呢，对于这个开源的这种许可证，像这个呃安卓、呃塞班，还有立蒙。呃，我们都去进行了充分的研究，把他们的许可证里的一些文本、一些条款都做了一个研究。我们最后得出来的呃一些体会，我在这里面说一下哈。
我们说它的专利政策呢是这样的：对于它这个核心的这种专利，就是安卓系统的这种核技术，它可能是我们说是基于 open source 的 GPL 啊原则。但是呢，对于它的这个应用层面上，我们看到它就变了。那么核技术呃，就是在它的基础技术这个里边，它其实是要希望大家都，如果你不申请专利是最好的，申请了专利呢，你要免费的许可给所有的用户。但是呢，我们看到了它应用层面上呢，他就说，如果你申请了这个专利，那么你应该以一个什么样的一个一个许可条件来让公平合理无歧视啊，不可撤销等等其他的这种条件来去许可大家。那我这些里面享受到是什么呢？如果是基于这样的一个许可政策，我们看到安卓系统将在它的应用层面进行了分裂。那也就是说，在它应用层面里面包围了很多专利的时候，它一定会引起专利的一个诉讼。所以呢，我下边就是想说，这个我们看到，就由于这样的一个呃一个分裂的这样一个政策一个状态，所以导致我们看近年来对 Facebook 提起的这个专利的诉讼，大概已经超过三十件了。我们看到对谷歌提出的这个诉讼呢，也在逐年的在增加。啊，那面对这样的一个一个现状，那么 Facebook 和这个呃 Facebook 和 Google 他们是个什么样的对策呢？他们马上就开始就自己也要去聚集一些专利，那么去建立一个专利防御的系统。那么我在来的之前，我特意。去做了一个检索，就是不仅仅是 Facebook 和 Google， 他们两个在做专利的防御系统。那么中国的很多互联网公司也在做这个专利的防御系统。对，我已经我已经啊上去了。那我在这里面给大家做的是从呃零五年到呃一二年的这样一个检索。一二年这个蓝色的有点不太准确，因为中国专利呢它有一个十八个月公开，所以到现在呢我们并不一定完全会把一二年申请的专利都统计出来，我们暂且就忽略一二年的，我们就从零五年到一一年来看，中国的三大互联网公司啊 t y s o n 百度还有阿里巴巴，那么他们的专利是在逐年增长的。那我们来，我们来看一看，他们在专利诉讼当中其实是几乎是为零的，或者是说有个别的一两件案件。那么他们基本上还是把专利呢作为一种防御。那我们来看雅虎和 Google 呢，它今在中国的这种申请，其实呢也还是保持了一个活跃的一个状态啊，也还是有。但是它在美国会很多，大家都知道啊，像这个 Google 已经收购了摩托罗拉的很多的这种专利。那我们在下边来看，像 IBM 和英特尔，它是一个传统的专利巨人。那么传统的专利巨人，我们看到它的这种专利呢，是申请是趋于下降的啊。那么它在呃近年来这专利下降，但是它早期积累下来这些专利，一定还是有生命力的。他们这些专利要去做经营，那么这些专利就可能发生一些转移，这种转移里边又会转移到互联网的开放平台里边去。那我再快速的就把我的这个结论性的意见给大家去啊过一下哈。那好，我们来看到是说，最近我们也关注了 Stanford 呃科技与呃这个法律评论上发表的这篇文章。我们其实对这篇文章呢，呃，我们感到非常的欣慰，就是说它能够给我们描述出来，大家最近热议的像 NPA 呃这呃这个这个领域里边像 CA 呃 CV 这样的一些公司，他们的经营模式是什么样的？完全没有一些呃价值上的这种倾向，就是给大家展示一下这个 NPE 这类的公司，他们呃到现在是呃未来将会如何去经营这个专利。实际上呢，我们也就是想去说，互联网开放平台未来它其实面对的也可能就是这一类的 NPE 的公司的专利的转移，同时他自己也可能是作为这样的一种角色啊。呃，我最后呢，呃，这个时间的关系，我就不再展开了。我只是想说一个结论，和这篇文章的观点呢比较接近。也就是说，这一类的公司聚集大量专利的这种公司，它正面的作用是做一种专利的防御基金。但是呢，在它做一个专利防御基金的这个时候，它可能会去伤害到一些创新和竞争。那么，呃，主要原因是，呃，主要的这个，呃，是什么理由呢？就是说，我在这里边。啊，就是想说，正常的专利诉讼，就我们正常这种专利制度给大家提供的这种权利，它会啊进，它会起到一种市场经济里边的这种大浪淘沙的作用，就是淘汰落后的这种产品和企业，那么鼓励创新，那么优胜的企业呢就胜出了。
。但我们看到，如果这类 NPE 的公司，它在大量的行使专利权的时候，就会引起大规模的专利诉讼。那么在引起大规模专利诉讼的时候，我们看到它就把专利呢，呃，创新也好，还有诉讼也好，就当成一种武器。这个时候，我们看到它把创新的目的就发生了变化。我们原来企业创新是为了提升自己的产品的竞争力，那现在我们看到这些公司的创新点，它就会有选择，它去选择那些其他企业的弱点，会去选择这个产业链里边哪些能够制约到竞争对手的那些点去进行发明创造，它已经背离了我们说专利制度早期的那种啊创新的这样一种功能。啊，这是我自己一些不太成熟的这种观点，所以我最后有一点结论，就是想说，我们其实早期很多公司都是受益这个制度，但是后期也可能会有一些公司呢，会这个受败于这个制度，也就是说，他在这样的一种诉讼当中呢，啊，特别是一些中小企业，当他还没有长大的时候，他可能就被这些巨人们呢，就我们说就打下去了哈，啊，不过呢，我自己的这个体会还有一点，就是知识产权这个制度就跟核技术是一样的。我们说，知识核技术呢，如果要用于人类的非常好的一种呃这个是应用和平利用呢，那我们说核技术带给人类的是一个福音。但如果核技术带来的这个不是应用的不好，我们想它给人类带来的就是一种毁灭。那我们说知识产权制度未必是毁灭，但是它也带来很大的伤害。所以我的观点就是说，要鼓励知识产权的和平利用。好，谢谢。Thank you to our distinguished panelists for some very interesting and thought-provoking presentations. I believe we have some time now for questions, so I'll invite anybody who has them to please approach the microphones. And I will start by asking also some questions of the panelists and ask them to react a little bit to each other's presentations. I want to start by asking anyone who's interested in answering this question Neil's presentation showed some of the icons of the American patent system. We are a country that has had a lot of prominent inventors, including Thomas Edison and Ben Franklin. And I contrast that a little bit with China, where a one book that was written, that was quite famous, said uh, was called "To Steal a Book is an Elegant Offense." And there has been an evolution in the opinions, I think, towards intellectual property over the years. So I'd like to ask our China experts a little bit about what the public perception is of the patent system. If there are icons like the ones we have here that are either inventors or otherwise that inform public perception of the patent system. Perhaps Singer, if you would like to. I think the um, you know it depends on market condition. I I went to China in '93. For the past 20 years, I think the. The market condition has changed, so we have, uh, uh, you know, people value IP more. When you have domestic company like Alibaba, Tencent, and they're growing up, so they are changing attitude. Also, you look at very interesting number utility model. You know, uh, Duane talked about half million application. Actually, 2012 was uh, close to three quarter million application utility model. And people say that is because incentive it provided by government, not necessary, because it's Chinese government cancel the subsidy for utility model, mostly. So I think probably they're saying, you know, we are having at the, at the stage of invention, but we can make improvement. So you see huge growth of that. And, and also because of change of law, now you file utility model, which hasn't gone through a substantial examination, but when you want to enforce them, you could go back to SIPO to seek, uh, you know, search on that. If you have good search reports, they have novelty, then you can enforce it in the court as good as invention. So probably those factors coupled together, people are really toward in innovating and, and applying more. But we need to look at those applications in detail. But in general, I think people value IP more. And those famous quote that, <laughs> you know, Yaze, Tosu is not a, is elegancy, which actually will, will pass because we are now more market economy right now in China. Comment, Roger, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I think people in China um, value inventions and they, they respect inventors. Now, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I can't think of a, uh, a famous icon of patent holders, a patent inventor, um, but 
bear in mind, China uh, didn't have a patent system, didn't have a patent law until the 1980s, until the mid-80s. But people do invent, and they, they get awards, they get rewarded. My, my father got, um, went, you know, was invited to Beijing to, to get awards for, for his uh, inventions, even though he didn't seek any patents. Um, and, he, and he still got uh, uh, VIP treatment everywhere because of that, even today. Um, uh, so, so I, I think people um, value inventions. Um, in terms of utility patents, I, I think that's just uh, the way the the law provides the incentives. Um, if if you know if the law does not allow utility patents and design patents, then everyone will only file invention patents or not file at all. But utility patents is a cost-effective model for a lot of people, whether for the right reason or wrong reason but it's cost effective and uh, you know, it kind of reminds me of, of uh, Professor Lamb's idea of uh, uh, gold-plated patents. So think of utility patents as not gold-plated patents. Other comments? I would like to also follow up a bit on some of the remarks about patent litigation abuses and I thought um, Singer's presentation was great at laying out some of the differences in the systems. So discovery costs are lower, litigation costs are lower, um, we don't have uh, juries in China. So I wanted to ask anybody on the panelists, and in particular our American counterparts who have looked closely at different types of litigation abuses or practices, do you think, based on what you see in China, that China will have a similar set of issues that it's coming down the pike? In, I mean, you talked about utility model patents, but if you can talk a little bit about the systems and how you see litigation evolving, litigation practice in China. So I can't talk about uh, exactly how things work in China, but I can tell you that in the United States, uh, with many patent infringement assertions, the, the discussions begin not by talking about whether someone infringes the patent, but how much the litigation is going to cost and how much cheaper uh, settlement is. Um, and uh, you, really that's because of the structure of U.S. litigation and particularly the exorbitant cost of discovery. Um, it, it does seem to me, as Judge Rader uh, remarked and, and Judge White did when he was talking about damages, that um, many of the things that the U.S. system is doing to uh, make things narrower um, on the discovery and uh, streamline that, as well as to try and remove the litigation cost as part of the dialogue uh, uh, is, is, is going to help reduce those sorts of problems. Um, I, I don't, it seems like there, from what I hear, there's a lot more um, uh, kind of patent activity in China where there's, there's more assertions. Uh, the issue there would appear to me to be really a remedy issue. What kind of relief people can get and what's the exposure more than the, the cost of litigation itself. I think discovery is, is a key issue, probably in the U.S. because the discovery is costly. But China have no discoveries. It's also problematic. I think you have to be somewhere in between. And also another issue is the, um, you know, the, the judgment, the quality of judgment in China. <coughs> For example, for the Snyder case, we haven't seen the, ju the judgment being published yet. So, so and, and, and you, the guiding case from Stanford, the, the project, you know, the Supreme Court guiding case is a good project. But the problem is not too many cases go to the Supreme Court. You have four level of court. Your patent case started with intermediate court and that high court. It doesn't go to the Supreme Court. So, so that if we could, you know, spread a little bit, let the high court and Supreme Court review those cases, say some other selective cases, really good cases, and make it binding, and we have a standard, uh, as a, at least as a floor, then we could improve a lot in China. To Neil's point, do you know if most of the Chinese cases do resolve in an injunction as well as damages, or if it's really usually about damages? In, in, in a Chinese court. In the Chinese yeah. court, Singer, I don't know. What's the question, sorry, I also asked. Oh, if, because Neil was talking about remedies and the pursuit of them, and I was wondering in the Chinese system if injunctions are pursued and received in most cases, or it's usually damages. Yeah, Maybe. most of the, um, uh, the foreign company are looking for injunction because the damage is unpredictable, because they don't have discovery. It's very difficult for you to prove those damages. So they all look for 
damage. For the Snyder case, they were able to uh, come up with a, such a big damage because they go through their tax filing locally. So they will be able to show that how much they're making. But in most cases, without discovery, it's just so difficult. And the injunction is still the, the key thing they're seeking.在中国的情况在中国关于这个专利侵权当中禁令和赔偿的问题实际上目前在中国的诉讼还没有发现像在美国前一段时间有很多大公司之间的大规模的专利诉讼然后呢法院的判决可能会说在禁令这个方面给予
I think they both go to the issue of the ongoing maturation of different institutions within the Chinese patent system. So Singer made the point earlier that while um, discovery may drive too many costs, at least you have discovery and that there should be a happy medium. Um, you don't want to have injunctive relief be abused, but you want to have it available so there's some teeth in your patent system and that people can respect intellectual property rights. Um, <coughs> similarly, uh, you want to make sure that um, you know, all of the pieces of the system are properly tuned, again, to encourage the right kind of innovation, the right kind of competition, um, and, and that you can achieve the overarching goals um, through the mechanisms that you have available. These things will take time. I, I think utility models are maybe centrally enforced through Shanghai, but invention patents, which are probably the types most commonly inserted by Chinese companies against other Chinese companies, are litigated in regional courts where there might be less consistency and, and uniformity, and maybe some of the procedures are still being updated. We can see that happen over time, and I think that the Chinese government with urging from actual uh, businesses will we'll probably see to it as well. Yeah, I, I think there are always people that will use utility model patents to scare others. But the, the, this is not necessarily a problem of the legal system because in the legal system, um, you can request um, invalidation proceeding. And once you make that request, um, the courts will usually will stay the case, stay litigation pending the outcome. So the courts do recognize utility models are different from invention patents and treat them differently. Now, for pe but people will be scared, especially small business people. They they don't have the legal knowledge, um, and, and they you know people try to exploit that. But that's something they 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 have to do. One innovation also in the United States, as to your first question, is the exclusion order which is available in the International Trade Commission, and there's something called a GEO, a general exclusion order, which for when the parties may change type and fold up shop and then start elsewhere, the injunction is against the product, not against the particular company, so that if it springs up in a different form, it's also still enjoined. So, another question for the floor. Um. Uh, my question is for Professor Zhang. Zhang老师刚才您提到就是过去您做了很多系统的研究就是关于这个开源程序然后包括美国这些公司的它开源程序那我们知道一般就说这个开源它的这个许可也分不同的种类有的一些是比较开放性的对下续的那些接收人员的
。那么到再往上一层，它可能就呃不那么开放了，但是它还有一点点开放。那么再往后，它又跟商业软件是兼容的，是并存的。那我们看到，在这个层层包裹的这种开放社区这个里边，它的这个许可证是非常复杂的。对于外边的再重新进入到这个里面的企业，它要有很多的这种法律的分析，才能够去把它的法律风险弄清楚。所以今天我一直都在说，所有搞开放的这种互联网公司，它的法务部一定要非常强，它不是在去做专利那个权利要求的分析，它是要去做专利许可证的分析。那么这个工作呢，就会最后也导致我们的诉讼成本也很高，法官要看懂很多很多的技术的许可证。嗯，我说。今天对我们的挑战就是说，法官可以找技术专家来看懂软件的这个原程序，但是有一天法官要看合同，你总不能让技术专家去看合同，那是法官自己要看合同。所以许可证的这种这个丛林是非常可怕的一件事啊，这是我的结论。那么然后我就在想说，中国的这种啊利用开源的这种状况，中国早期呢确实是非常希望利用 Linux 来开发出自己很多的应用软件。但是他没有去认识到开源的这样的一个资源如何去利用比较安全，还有以后他的这种服务，所以呢，他没有持续下去，并没有很多的这种成功。所以中国有一个叫红旗 Linux， 我们看到，如果今天红旗 Linux 要如果成功了，大概可能就不是微软一一霸天下的这个时代了。但是呢，因为他没有弄清楚，所以他的应用没有弄好。尽管北京市和上海市的政府采购都曾经采用过 Linux 作为它的操作系统，但是它没有后续的跟踪，所以这是我们看到开源的应用。那么今天呢，实际上并不是说呃。有一些很多公司、小公司，它还在利用开放的这种资源来去研发新的软件，但是更多的中国公司，它还是开放了之开。利用开源的软件研发出来的新的东西，它又回归到商业软件去了。所以这样呢，它并不是一个彻底的开放，它的这种生命和这个发展，它没有一定的这种规律性，所以比较。啊，我们说是乱象重生啊，有这样的一种状况。那么今天呢，几个大的互联网公司呢，我刚才举的一些例子哈，也是在说他们的这种开放还是都在接口和界面的这个程度上开放，还并没有像安卓的这样的一种开放，也没有像这个阿帕奇软件的这样一种开放。那么未来是不是他们会去采用这样一种开放的模式，完全取决于这些公司的商业模式和他们的商业理念。啊，如果他们有一个自己成熟的一整套的这种呃开源的系统，我相信他们可能会开放。但如果他只是在中间有一个局部的这样一个技术的一个优势，他不会去完全开放。谢谢。我也来回答一下，在阿里巴巴，我们有超过一百个开源项目，都是对开源社区开放的。那么其中有用 GPL 的，也有用 Apache 的。I just want to add a very simple footnote to what um, Singer just said. Um, well, this is a minor correction. Guiding cases are actually not limited to cases decided by the Supreme People's Court. Um, they could be cases actually recommended by lower level courts, decided by these lower level courts. And then we have already seen a pattern. Every uh, quarter, the Supreme People's Court releases four guiding cases. And then up to right now, we have already seen 16 guiding cases, but none of them is actually an intellectual property case. And I've been waiting for IP cases. For your information, while not only upper, lower level courts can recommend a potential representative case as a guiding case, because it's selected by the Supreme People's Court, all other parties in the society have a channel to do that. So that's why if you want to know more information about the system, please visit our website. <laughs> this is great. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have time for one more question, May? No. Okay. We're out of time. Please join me in thanking the panel.